My name's Adele Onyango and welcome to another episode of Legally Clueless. No, seriously, I have no clue what I'm doing, but I'm pretty sure I'm not the only one. Hey you, welcome to episode 140 of Legally Clueless. Super excited to have you as part of the team. And if this is your first time ever listening to this podcast, welcome, welcome, welcome. First and foremost, join our online community. We're on Instagram at Legally Clueless Podcast. There's a link to that page in the show notes. You can also chit chat about the podcast on Twitter if you do, so that I can stalk you easier. Just include the hashtag Legally Clueless. And ooh. Another thing you need to check out is our YouTube channel. There is season one of our video series that has 13 episodes of 13 different Africans sharing some amazingly powerful stories. Then there's also a five-part tour series that's out from our tour of Kenya to our tour of Paris. Very exciting stuff there. And in fact... I'm also so excited because season two of our video series starts on the 19th of November, which is this Friday. Well, depending on when you're listening to this. So that's when our second season of our video series starts. Obviously, that's going to be out on our YouTube channel. So go there and subscribe, turn on notifications so that you can be the first to watch that episode. In fact, let me just do your solid. This is what you can expect in episode one of season two. So we started to save. Now, you know when they say love is love is blind? Man, there's red flags that you see afterwards. <laughs> oh man, we did save. Now, Corona, the pandemic had happened. I did. I tried the whole with my own accounts and stuff, but I think because media was laying off people, banks were very, very hesitant to like give you a backing, like a loan or something. I hadn't joined a SACO at that time, but he had, although his account was, his account was dormant. This is, I feel stupid saying it now. So we saved in his account, guys. It was not joint. I had no, I was just here on trust and love because I thought, you know, it's ours, you know, I mean, yeah, we're going to eventually do this. It's definitely an episode worth watching. So 19th of November, it's a Friday at exactly 10 a.m. Episode one from season two goes out and yeah, go and subscribe to our YouTube channel so that you don't miss that. However, moving back to this particular episode, speaking of our tour series, the story that is coming up a little later in this episode was recorded when we were in Akuru, a very powerful story by a guy called Brian. Listen to this. It was around seven. And then a buddy of mine texted me and asked me if I was up for a night out. I sneaked out of home. It was my first time ever. We we got into the car. We went to Nakuru. We clubbed, hopped, and uh, on our way home, that's when we got the accident. But the cop the cop wasn't drunk because he was he was the one driving the car. But I'm told that the trailer that hit us was on the wrong. I remember fragments. I remember the lights. But I remember thinking that hey, those lights are too close. A big bang. It was a head-on collision. We were five in the car. Three of them died on the. Spot. Pot, I was put in a sitting position, though I had broken my spine, and I had a very interesting ambulance ride with two very beautiful nurses. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe they were just being nice, but I felt like they were flirting. <laughs> it was so nice. That is such a powerful story, and it's by Brian. It's going to be coming up a little later in this episode. Okay, so I'm going to shift things around in this episode. We're going to start off with the song of the week. Yeah, and it's such an interesting song. You may know of it, and maybe you've forgotten about it, because that's what happened with me. Randomly just rediscovered it, and I was like, oh my god, I forgot how much I love this one. It is by Fela Kuti, and the name of the song is What a No Get Enemy. I really love it. I love the live instruments, of course but the English lyrics I'm always so intrigued by them I find them to be very poetic yeah so I I really like this song I'll put a link to it in the show notes make sure you go and check it out next thing I want to share before we jump into the 100 African stories is around gratitude it hit me this week that whenever I was thinking about making my gratitude list I was looking at external things so people around me who are special in my life connections I have with them or like just nature and how magical it is blue skies beautiful trees all of that but one thing I was not doing is looking internally and saying hey I'm really grateful that I survived this or I stood up for myself here but this week after like a series of 
random overthinking thoughts i was like hang on i really come through for myself i i should have certain aspects about myself on my gratitude list and so i have two (laughs) which sounds like such a few points but no they're two really heavy important points okay on my list this week and the first one is that i never let fear win especially in a moment that if i did i'd have been such a sad person such a sad person and the specific moment that i'm grateful to myself for fighting off fear no matter how long it took me is when i was in a job that I thoroughly disliked that made me so unhappy in an environment that really almost broke me and it took me a while yes (laughs) but at the very end I didn't let fear win and it's but such awesomeness from that one decision and if I didn't make that decision for myself I wouldn't have built what I've been able to build today and so that's one huge thing I'm super grateful to myself for number two is ooh. I like this one, that I am courageous enough to feel. I feel all of my emotions and meet them where they are. I acknowledge them. I converse with them. And after jotting down my bullet points, I am able to articulate them. to whoever those emotions concern you know and i just think in our society it's like you're conditioned to believe that those who show emotion are weak you have to board them up and be gangster and hard and tough and you know thick skin all of these things when in reality i feel like that's easy to do what's harder and requires you to be more courageous and to introspect and confront yourself which many people are scared of doing is allowing yourself to feel and knowing your feelings so well that you can almost immediately identify what the feeling is, why you're feeling it, and you can articulate it if need be. And so I'm really in a space where I'm allowing myself to feel whatever emotions they are. They could be beautiful, rosy, wonderful emotions. I'm allowing myself to show my feelings to others without requiring them to reciprocate it or requiring something from them, which is so wonderful. And I'm also allowing myself to feel the not so good emotions. Yeah, that's where I was going. The not so good emotions. And I don't mean like sadness and pain. I think I'm I'm quite comfortable with those two. Anger is the one I'm not. <laughs> it's not my friend. <laughs> it's the one I'm still trying to figure out. But by bad emotions, I mean, you know, those really human emotions like jealousy. You know, it's irrational. If I feel it, I acknowledge it. It's there for a reason. I don't shit on myself for feeling it. I acknowledge it. And then I say, but babe, you know, it's also a bit irrational. And I'm like, yeah, 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 actually. <laughs> enough of that sis you know I think it takes a lot of courage to be able to do that and I'm very grateful to myself for being able to be that courageous yeah so that's on my list of course if you are doing these lists as well however you want to do them I think it's it's I'm finding it to be a very interesting exercise to look inward as well when you're looking for what to be grateful for weekly hey I hope you managed to find a couple of things. All right, let's jump into 100 African stories. As I said, this particular story was recorded during our tour in August when we were in Nakuru. Brian is a storyteller. He has such a refreshing spirit. My goodness. And his story is really about an accident that changed his life forever. 100 African stories on Legally Clueless. Stories from Africa. So my name is Brian Mushiri Wihenya. I am 27 years old. I come from a small village in Nakuru called Mangu. I'm the first born of three boys. I'm a village boy, born and bred, and it's nice to, to get out of the village sometime. <laughs> yeah, I think life before the accident was typical of the people that I've grown up with. I I come from a big family. Though we are just three in in our family, I come from an extended family of cousins. So we grew up in an extended family kind of setup. Mm -hmm. So I grew up with many cousins, about seven Mm -hmm. or six cousins. We had a good life growing up. We we did farming, we had dogs, we had rabbits, we had pigs. Mm -hmm. I think I had a really nice childhood. And then I grew up and then I went to school. Mm -hmm. I had dreams that maybe changed because of the accident. I had two dreams. I either wanted to to join the army because I I really 
liked the idea of being in uniform. I always liked that and the discipline that is involved in, in the army. So I either wanted to join the army or I wanted to work in media, either uh, as a writer or as a producer, mm -hmm. because I'm really passionate about writing. I went to high school. Uh, funny enough, I'm born in the village and I went to high school in the village, so I've never been able to escape it. <laughs> I went to primary in a school called Waka Junior. Mm -hmm. It's in Yahururu. Mm -hmm. And then I went to Odaya Boys in Nyeri. And then in campus, I came back to Nakuru in Jomo Kenyatta University, mm -hmm. the town campus. When I went to campus, I didn't, I didn't perform the way I would, want it, I would have wanted to in, in high school because when I joined high school, I was pretty smart. When I was in primary, I was performing really well. But when I came to high school, I flopped Kidogo. <laughs> so I, didn't, I wanted to do a course in maybe mass communication, but I didn't have the grades to do it. So I had to, to go to, for a bridging course in Kabarak University. And then I was advised to do a course in procurement, procurement, which is a lot of business. Yeah. I didn't quite like it. <laughs> But I did it anyway. Uh, campus, it was a town cam campus, so there wasn't too much going on. But again, I was still the village boy. Yeah. I had a lot of chores because I was commuting mm. from home to school. So I had to do a lot of chores in the morning. So I would, I would uh, take care of the pigs, take care of the cows, and then I'll head to school. And then, though I've taken a shower, you can't get rid of that smell. <laughs> You're still smelling like cows. Aremis, it was pretty fun. I had a few friends, but I've always struggled Kidogo with making friends because I was quite shy. I was quite uh, self-conscious about how I looked. Yeah. And then I was balding when I was very young. <laughs> so it was hot and cold. I didn't finish. I got the accident when I was on my third year, second semester. When I was in my third year of university, in 20, that was back in 2014, uh, that's when I got the accident. How it happened was basically, it was on a Friday, I can remember. It was on the 7th of uh, February. And I can remember I was looking forward to Valentine's Day that, that year. Mm. I was in a long distance relationship with a, with a girlfriend in Nairobi at the time, yeah. and we were making a lot of plans. Yeah. I remember when, I think about that 7th, I remember being very excited about Valentine's. And so uh, a buddy of mine called me. I had just committed from school from school to home. Mm -hmm. It was around 7, mm -hmm. 7, 7, 7 p.m. I was in my parents' house and I was just chilling. And then a buddy of mine texted me and asked me if I was up for, for maybe a night out. Mm -hmm. I had never received this, this request before. Mm -hmm. So I was being invited for a rave and I was quite excited. But I come from a very conservative home. So my parents were not going to let me go out. Mm -hmm. I just sneaked. I sneaked out of home. It was my first time ever. Mm -hmm. And I went, I met my friend. And now my friend had other friends. Mm -hmm. Now the other friends, the other friend was the owner of the car, who was also a policeman. So we, we got into the car, we went to Nakuru, mm -hmm. we clubbed home. This entire time I'm calling my friends from town and I'm asking them to meet up so that mm -hmm. we, can, we can share them the, the experience. Mm -hmm. I didn't have money, but it was still nice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so we club hopped Kidogo. By the end of the night, now when it got to around 2, 2 a.m., I got really tired. I didn't have money, so I didn't have money for drinks. So I was sleepy, I was tired, I wanted to go home. But the policeman was very, was very adamant but that he wanted to go and pick up a girlfriend of his. Mm -hmm. It was a long story. So he, we ended up going home at around four. And uh, on our way home, that's when we got the accident. Yeah. But the cop, the cop wasn't drunk because he was, he was the one driving the car. Because that's why he was keeping us there because he wanted to go and pick a girlfriend somewhere. But he wasn't drinking. But I cannot be so sure because I want, I wasn't with him the entire time. Mm -hmm. But I'm told that the, the trailer that hit us mm -hmm. was on the wrong. So, mm -hmm. yeah, that's how it happened. I remember fragments, bits mm -hmm. and pieces, mm -hmm. because I, I remember the lights. You know, like. We always have those close calls when you're in the, on the road, mm. when a car gets too close, you mm. think you're going to hit, mm. but I, in the last second, it goes to the side. So I, I thought it was going to be the same. I didn't think that it was going to be like an accident or something. But I remember thinking that, hey, those lights, 
are too close. So and then now a lad, a big bang afterwards followed. It was it was a head on collision. So it was really grisly and really it was a lot of distraction. Mm. We were five in the car. Three of them died you know, on the spot. I survived with the, with the girlfriend that we were waiting to pick. From there, I don't remember, but I'm told that a good Samaritan took us and uh, drove us to a nearby hospital. But I feel like that's when my injury got worse because I am told that I was put in a sitting position. Though I had broken my spine, you know, like the good thing to do would be to put you in a flat surface. But they put me, they sat me on a chair. And, and I think that is where the injury got worse. Mm. Because I think for spinal cord injuries, the first 24 hours are very important. The way the injury is treated, it could it could could make all the difference. So the severity of my injury got worse during those first few hours. I came to after the after the accident. I came to probably funny enough. I got the accident on a, on a Saturday morning. That's that's when the accident happened at 4 a.m. in the morning. But I came to I think three. My memories my memories now came back about three days. Now what I remember from at this point three days or four days after, when I was coming from Aga Khan Hospital. Mm -hmm. Basically what happened is, after the accident, mm -hmm. they said that it was quite severe, so I had to be transported to Na Nairobi Hospital, mm -hmm. to, not to Nairobi, to Aga Khan Hospital mm -hmm. in Nairobi. So the same Saturday evening, I had to look for an ambulance, mm -hmm. And uh, we went to Aga Khan Hospital in Nairobi. I stayed there for, for the weekend. It got too expensive. I think for two, three days, the bill had already amounted to maybe a million because I was in the HDU and it's quite expensive there. I remember my memory is seeing Aga Khan University Hospital. That is what I remember. Yeah, and I had a very interesting ambulance ride with two very beautiful nurses. <laughs> And they were maybe they were just being nice, but I felt like they were flirting. <laughs> it was so nice. They were sirens and beautiful women. <laughs> yeah. Ah, it was heartbreaking for my parents because when I got to the first hospital after the scene of the accident, I was asked to give out a number. I can't remember, but uh, this is what I'm told. I was asked to give a number and I was too afraid to give my parents' number. So I gave uh, a friend's number. So that friend called my cousin and then my cousin called my parents. So my parents, uh, by this time, they think that I'm in the, in the room, in my room. So my cousin called my parents on that fateful Saturday morning and he he told them that I was involved in a bad accident and they were like no but we saw this this guy going to to his room mm. last night so it was it was quite shocking to them and that is the saddest thing from my side that I I put my parents through that and uh, to 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 just wake up on a normal Saturday morning and mm -hmm. find out that your son is now has been involved in an accident and not just any accident, mm -hmm. a life changing one. So that is when I think life life took like a three sixty turn for mm -hmm. them. And yeah, they told me that it was it was it was quite difficult. They were in some kind of denial. They didn't want to believe it. They just came to, to the hospital and our journey began from there and our lives changed. I don't have a moment when the doctors came and they told me that you are paralyzed, you're not paralyzed. I think it's an interesting story because I think I googled that when I came back home from hospital. What they were telling me is that I had broken my neck, but I wasn't sure at the time I didn't know how the spine worked, what it meant to 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 have an injury like that. So there wasn't there wasn't one particular time when the doctors came and sat me down or sat my parents. But my parents knew in Aga Khan, they had been told after some x-rays, they had been told what to expect, but I didn't know. I came home, I googled, and then I found out that I would never walk again. People text me after a while and they ask me now, how, do you try to stand, do you try to walk? But I understand they, they don't they don't know how, how severe my injury is, but I basically can't feel anything from my armpits. And I have very limited use of my upper limbs because I don't have any finger movement. My body from the armpits is silent. It's like a rock. If I lay down here and then you went for a week, you would find me in the, on the same spot because I don't have sensation or movement anywhere beneath the armpits. So there's no trying when you have this kind of injury. I thought that after a while, 
I would regain sensation or movement, but I was just feeling very numb and I had a lot of denial. So when people would come and they would, they would, they would pinch my toes, they would ask me, can you feel this? I would say, uh, yeah, 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 I'm feeling. <laughs> so uh, I didn't want to admit I didn't want to admit that it was that bad. I, I didn't even think about strain because my body was, I, I couldn't feel any, any, any part or any inch of my body. So I, I didn't even, I couldn't even try. I think when I came back, I, I remember when I came back, it was, it was a rainy afternoon. When I came back home and my cousins were there, my extended family, they welcomed me, but I just wept when I got to, to bed and I just, realized that my life had changed. It was easy when I was in hospital because when you are sick or when you are injured and you are in hospital, it's a reassuring feeling. But when you come home, it dawns that now this is the life that you are going to live. So it was quite, it was quite, quite difficult for me to be honest. And I fell into deep, deep depression mm -hmm. the following month because I was in bed basically six days a week and I would only sit on my wheelchair on Sundays. I had pressure wounds, I had pain, they they put some chuma rods on my neck to to support it so those were still healing and it, it was painful so it was it was a difficult time to be honest and more so for my parents because now they had to leave whatever that they were doing to stop whatever that it is that they were doing and to start now learning to give me care since then they have been my primary caregiver sometimes i feel like maybe when i thought that i was i would get out of that funk for some time mm -hmm. and then I would go back into it because you know like healing is a very is a very long journey mm. and it's not one destination so sometimes I'd feel like I'm better but when the lights were off that's when it would hit me the most I had a lot of insomnia mm. I couldn't sleep I couldn't I didn't have appetite but I would say my life changed when I got my first wheelchair not my first wheelchair my first motorized wheelchair I think it gave me a lot of freedom it showed me all the possibilities that I had it showed me that I could still live a fulfilling life so when I got it in 2016 I think that was a turning point just feeling like I could have that freedom if i wanted to get from this place to that place i could mm. for the first one year to one and a half years after the accident i had believed i had i had told myself that i wouldn't amount to anything because for that entire time i'd spent my my days in bed all i did was watch movies and be sick and my skin was it was being affected by the rods so mm. it, it was also affecting how i, I viewed myself mm. and i wasn't talking to myself in very kind words and through my depression stage my parents were still there still encouraging me my friends were still there but I couldn't be helped at the time because they can have all the support in the world but if you are not willing to leave then you can't yeah, yeah so I think now in 2016 when I got the wheelchair I think I, I started believing in myself and I started wanting to do more to visit new places mm -hmm getting out of the house, even though in the beginning it wasn't that easy, but the will was there. And we, we had a lot of financial constraints after the accident. Jacob didn't have an online in his school at the time. So they, they, they would say that I would travel to school like a few times a, a week and that didn't make sense because we didn't have a car. I, couldn't, I wasn't strong enough. That made me a bit happy because I didn't want to do the procurement thing, but I would still want to to go back to school but do something else. We always have this conversation with my parents because I feel like I always struggle to know who who I am when it comes to relating with other people because when I'm with my parents, when I'm at home, when I'm with my friends, they don't make me feel like I'm I'm disabled and I don't feel like I'm disabled. So I don't feel the need to be cautious or to, to be reserved. Mm -hmm or to, to be discern, to, to be too discerning of people's intentions. But now when I come to the world, I don't make that switch. I'm still thinking that everybody sees me as the people around me see me. So when I come to you, Adele, I don't come to you and, uh, and, I'm, and I'm taking a minute, I'm, I'm taking a step back to see what your intentions are. I, I think 
in my mind i i i think you you see me as i see myself and maybe that is the biggest my biggest flaw because i sometimes i fail to understand that to to many people i'm be, i'll be the first disabled person they meet so and they won't know how to to react to me or how to to relate to me so sometimes the people how would i put it some sometimes people think that they want to to have some uh, an honest relationship with me but then the the intentions are not are not long term and then now uh, they it's just maybe some kind of curiosity just to know like mm. oh, how do you live or what, what does your life entail and then after that curiosity face is done they just move on and that has been the the hardest part for me because still i don't learn i have a very hard head <laughs> The hardest thing for me has been when people come to my life and it's so it's so hot when people come to my life it's so hot and they want to know everything about me they want to know how I do and I match their energy if they want to know me I want to know them I want to be invested in them but when that fire goes down from their side and my fire doesn't go down so I'm left there thinking where did you go <laughs> what went wrong it's been 7 years but i'm still learning i think uh, when people hear that my name is brian they think that i'm the heart the one who 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 breaks heart <laughs> yeah. who breaks hearts but i think i've had my fair share my friend i have a good friend called kwame and he he always tells me that maybe it's my big heart maybe it's how i am how empathetic i am but i've had instances in the past when friendships or intimate relationships where they don't always end the way that you would hope they they do it started when right from when i got the accident yeah. just a few months and the people i thought would be would stand with me they ended up not being there not being present and that really that really broke my heart because i hoped that they would stand with me they would be they would walk with me no pun intended <laughs> I hoped that they would work with me in this in this journey because you know in this journey it's quite difficult and you it helps when you have people who are holding holding your hand and when I got um how do I say it when I got confident enough to start dating when I started seeing amazing women beautiful women and and I was so invested in them and and I knew right from the go I knew that it was always going to be very difficult to be in a relationship with someone like me because of my injury things can be quite complicated especially especially when it comes to to logistics mm. when you have to go to four dates mm. you have to be very considerate mm. or when they are coming to visit you they they will always it will always be them who have to do more more of the work yeah because when i'm here at elend and maybe i'm seeing someone in akuru town mm-hmm. it would be easier for them to come than for me to go when you find someone who is not willing to to understand that it would be very hard to to be in a position when you, they can be with you without feeling like they are giving too much mm-hmm. i can be with them without feeling like i'm asking too much from them so i've been in, in a couple of relationships and some of them have not ended in a good way uh, left me a bit heartbroken but mm. at least i'm still light skin kidogo <laughs> and i still have my name Brian. yeah i think i'm um, i am my own worst enemy because of how because of how critical i am most of the time i don't even blame the other person i blame myself i ask myself why did you go on with this relationship where else there were red flags or mm. indications that maybe it wasn't the right thing most of the conflict that i have is within myself just trying to reconcile like why are you making these decisions or why are you putting yourself in this position in this situation so if i figure out how to deal with my own issues not necessarily how people react to me or how people relate to me i would have hacked life when i find myself in in heartbreaking situations i think i fall back to the basics i fall back to my family my friends i think my parents are basically my best friends we mm-hmm. we spend a lot of time together and they have been there they 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 they've seen it all so they just talk to me and i use also writing as 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 a way to ease my mind i i listen to a lot of music yeah basically family writing and listening to music and just enjoying my solitude that mm-hmm. is that is what works for me i've always been passionate about writing since i was in primary school i realized that when i wrote it it was so much better than my classmates 
<laughs> and when I went to high school, now people started realizing that I had a talent in, I had a way with words. Mm -hmm. I have not, I've never been a flamboyant writer. I don't use big words, but <laughs> maybe when I tell a story, it, it captures the mind, the minds of and imagination of people. So that is when it started. And it was funny because people started paying me to write letters for them. And I also had a good handwriting, so it helped. <laughs> But I've never been very savvy in business, so I would do such a good work, such such a good job, and then they would pay me with lollipops, <laughs> two slices of bread. But I was happy to do it because I enjoyed writing. But I, looking back, I could have raised my bar a little higher, maybe asked for something more. But I've never been business savvy, so when I came from high school, I knew that I wanted to do something related to that. But uh, when I came to university, I stopped writing because I didn't have a platform at the time. So maybe around 2015, my cousin suggested that maybe you should start writing. At the time, I had uh, I had 150 friends on Facebook. She asked me, she told me to start writing. So I started writing short stories, funny stories, stories about my life, maybe sharing my experiences. And yeah, that grew. People started to be invested in my story. And yeah, pole pole, I grew my audience. And that is what led to, to me starting to get paid to write. Yeah. Yeah, and that was very rewarding. My friend and mentor, her name is Rehab. She was so gracious to, to help me transition from being just a, a Facebook writer to, to be an article writer. And she was patient and she was, she has literally paved the path for me. And that is when I started. I, I, I think I was first paid. Before before I started writing for Potent Touch, mm -hmm. I had been doing the academic writing gigs. And that had those had given me a lot of money as well. But mm -hmm. the most rewarding was when I started doing articles. I did articles for maybe one year and then I got another job on another blog called Love Matters. Mm -hmm. Now, Love Matters, they, they just give you, they, they just want you to write about love, sex, and relationships. That was interesting as well. Yeah, so I got to, to broaden my wings, mm -hmm. Kidogo, and it's it's been so exciting to, to be paid for something that you are okay doing for free. Right now, I had been on a short break, short writing break, but I'm, but now I'm back. I'm, I'm writing for, for Potentash, mm -hmm. the blog, mm -hmm. and maybe, hopefully, I'll go back to Love Matters. Mm -hmm. I also write on Facebook, on my Facebook, Brian Moshiri Wehenya. And I'm also branching out to doing TikTok. I did a TikTok and then it went viral, and now a couple of people know me. You know, like TikTok, I found that people are very interested about me and wanting to know how I got... I, I, came to be on a wheelchair, so it was basically an introduction, just telling people what my name is, how I got to be on a wheelchair, and yeah, it got 46, 4.6 million views, and for a village boy, that that is, that was so big. I think the, the biggest change after the accident is how I look at myself. You remember I mentioned that I was very shy, very self-conscious about myself, maybe how I looked. Like I said, I was balding very, at a very young age. I was wondering, if you if you you don't even have a girlfriend and you your hair is already falling off, what is to become of you? Yeah, so my confidence has grown immensely, and uh, my belief in the belief in myself has grown so much, and my sp my perspective my, the perspective in which I view things is so different, and I feel like I have so so much so much to live for and so much to give that's why i was in, in around 20, 20, 2018 i launched uh, my foundation which is called strong spine which i wanted to give back the first wheelchair the one that changed my life uh it was a couple of friends that came together and bought it for me so i felt like if these people changed my life with one wheelchair, maybe I can also change someone else's life with something that they really need. So Strong Spine has been running for, for, for that long. I raise funds, I give wheelchairs, and um, but the most important thing that I give, that I, that I work on, is adult diapers. Because most disabled people, not all, but most, especially those who have spinal cord injuries, severe cerebral, cerebral palsy, muscular dystrophy, or mistress of <laughs> that word <laughs> that word again i'm from the village i have a heavy tongue so yeah they, they really 
that is a basic need for us. So I'm very passionate about it. It's the way like girls need sanitary towels. They have to have them. So we also have to have them. And for, for us, it's it's even more important because for girls, you, you need them like for a couple of times a, a month. But we need them for probably a lifetime. And they are so expensive. They are so, so super expensive. So that is what I've been trying to, to raise awareness on and uh, maybe to try and lobby for, for, for them to be tax-free so that people can afford them because like a packet of 10 costs a thousand shillings. Yeah, so and you, you, you could use like a two or three in a day. So you see, that is what I'm focusing my energy on right now. But when I see someone in need, uh, I, I always reach out and try to, to talk to my people and see how we can help. Yeah, so I'm a changed man. And it's not just the fact that I cannot walk. It's the fact that I can, that I can be here and give my story and not feel, not feel sad about it. The fact that I can see someone else in my position, in the in a similar position, and want to encourage them. And I wasn't this person seven years ago. Uh, seven years ago, just me and the pigs and my bald head. <laughs> I think we have so much power as a society to, to impact the lives of disabled people, especially when it comes to uh, our, the stereotypes that we have regarding, regarding disability or disabled people. I think we need to really think about them and think about how it affects people like us when mm. we, we, we go to, to places to, we go to places and we are discriminated upon insensitive comments mm. or inaccessibility, we can't access uh, access services, things like those, unemployment. Mm -hmm. So it's very important for, for society to, to start viewing us as complete people, not just broken things that always need to be to be fixed. We have feelings, we have ambitions, we have dreams, and it would be so nice to be treated as such. Catch more African stories in the next episode of Legally Clueless. Wasn't that just a super powerful ugh, story, right? I know I say this for almost all the stories, but it's one of those that will sit with you for the rest of your life. I really do think so. And then I really just love Brian's sense of humor. Like it peeps <laughs> in and out of his story so beautifully, man. And after we recorded his story, him and I and one other person from the co-working space we were recording in Nakuru, that's called Colib Center. It's in Egerton University, fantastic place. So the guy in charge of the mm, church, <laughs> what was that wing? The guy in charge of PR and communications, him, myself, and Brian had tea afterwards. And you could just like feel, almost feel his spirit. It's just so real and so pure and just so refreshing. And so what I have done is I've put a few links in the show notes for you to connect with Brian and this wonderful spirit of his. One, I've put a link to his Facebook. I've also put a link to his TikTok. Then I've put three links to his writing. So there's a link to an article he did about women who are otherwise abled and the challenges they face around menstrual health. He also has another article, I'll put a link to it, about adult diapers. He spoke a bit about that in his story. And then the third link is a story he did about love and sex after his accident. And he's such a beautiful writer, so I would love you to check them out, connect with Brian. He's just he's just one of those really good humans, guys. So so yeah, links are in the show notes. Also, if you want to share your story on this podcast, all you have to do is click the link in the show notes that shows you a Google form. Fill out the form and I will get back to you. I do know that it does take some time, but it's also because there's many people wanting to share their stories. So just hang tight. I will get to you. And then if while listening to any episode of Legally Clueless, you hear something that you absolutely connect with, just record a voice note and send that to me on our hotline. Hi Adele, uh, my name is Judy and I've just finished listening to episode 139 where yeah. i really 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 like really resonate with that because i think it was the same case with me and then she's the last one i'm the last one also i think my mom died in my hands but maybe that time i was too young to understand that also doing the cpr and all everything she said i think i 
resonate with her. Also, the part where she talks about grief, you have learned. At times, you have to accept they've gone, they'll not come back. So, like, my mom died in October, so I spent my last month really down and all that. But I think when um we were about to celebrate her anniversary, because it's four years now, I just felt the need to celebrate her, celebrate her life, celebrate the kind person she was, the loving and warm person. Everyone loved to be around her. She's taught me that, like, I'll be celebrating my mom every day. Such stories really help us and, you know, make, as she has said, you're not alone so yeah i'm not alone in this journey i really really thank you for this platform thank you so much judy for um first listening to the podcast and then recording this audio notes i am really sorry about you know the loss of your mom just hearing a bit of what you went through that must be very heavy and i'm also so glad that you found people or a space that you can connect with even through the tough things we go through in life i'm glad that you found that here on the podcast and i'm also trying to do that to celebrate my mom a bit more although i think i failed like just a couple of hours ago i was completely in tears <laughs> on phone with a friend because something just didn't go re okay a lot of things just didn't go my way earlier today and it was just very emotional and I called my friend and I was in tears and I'm just telling him I want I want my mom so sometimes sometimes I am able to 100% celebrate her think about the good times laugh even and then these days like today when I'm just like the only person who fully understands me is no longer here but yeah sorry i went on a rant it's just i just had a very hectic couple of hours before recording this and yeah <laughs> thank you judy <laughs> back to you thank thank you so much for sending through that message and i'm sending you all my love if you want to share something that you connected with on this podcast all you have to do is record a voice note and send that to our hotline which is plus 254-786-628-790 that number is also in the show notes and also remember 19th november which is this friday well i keep saying that and i don't know when you're listening to this man you could be listening to it on friday morning 19th november season two of the legally clueless video series starts and i'm super excited and it's all going down on our youtube channel so make sure you subscribe and turn on your notifications if you check the show notes there's a link to a youtube channel there if you're listening on a platform that doesn't have show notes oh sorry <laughs> just go onto youtube and search legally clueless our beautiful yellow set will pop up and finally, if you're in Kenya, this podcast plays on Trace Radio here every Monday and Wednesday at 12 noon and 11 p.m. every Friday at 12 noon. So if you go to traceradio.co.ke, you can stream Trace there and you can also get a list of the frequencies depending on where in Kenya you're at. All right. Thank you so much for listening to this episode to the very end. I have to end it now because all my neighbors... <laughs> All together at once. <laughs> I've turned on the water pumps. Yo, I gotta go. That's it for this episode of Legally Clueless. You can share this podcast with your friends. You can keep it for yourself. I'm not judging. Just make sure you're here next week for the next episode.